you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so high. Glorious in heaven above Humbly you came to the earth you created All for our sake became poor Here I am to worship Here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it costs. To see my sin upon that cross, I'll never know how much it costs. To see my sin upon that cross, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on a road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Well, good morning, church. It's great to be with you today. And I always say that, and I always mean it. Can anybody say, can anybody know what time it is? Can you say it's vacation Bible school time? I don't know if you were a kid when you when you were a kid if you had vacation Bible school, but when I was a kid, we had vacation Bible school, and it was totally different than what you're seeing here today. You know, there's a lot of work that goes in all of this stuff, and this year's theme is this monumental God that you and I get to serve, and I'm going to talk to you about that today. Now, this next week, I want you to be praying because all next week we're doing our vacation Bible school here at Western Hills. And we need you to pray for all the kids that walk through that door back there because we're trying our best to reach out to them with the love of Jesus Christ. And, and hopefully through that, we're going to plant a seed into a heart that's going to make a difference in the life of a bunch of kids. And so, you know, when I was a kid growing up in vacation Bible school, it was more like this, what I remember. And I'm not downplaying anybody's vacation Bible school. But when I was a kid, I remember, you know, we just went, it was... Pretty plain, if you will. We got the stories, which was great because I love to talk about Jesus. But at the end of it, you know, we got cookie and a Kool-Aid. You remember those days? Well, it's totally different today. And there's a lot of work that's gone into this and all the people that have put all this together. Um, even tomorrow, we're not even finished yet. I mean, this is just the set, the beginning of. We're going to build some, you know, we're going to have a campsite over here. You've got a little fire burning here. You know, we got some cactus up here that they've made. It's going to be wonderful. and We're looking forward to that. But you be praying for us. I'm going to come back in just a few minutes and I'm going to talk to you about this monumental God that you and I get to have a privilege of serving and knowing. Isn't that wonderful? I think it is. You come on back. We'll talk about that one more time. God bless you. See you then. Spirit will be joy, says 
time of my life have been around the table sharing a meal with family and friends. Today we are rejoicing in sharing the table with our Lord and Savior. Dexter will read Luke 22 verse 14 through 20. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Please let us pray. O most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you with praises and thank, thanking you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sin. Jesus was sinless and was crucified for us. Father, we ask forgiveness of our sin, so as we take this bread, which represents your, your, your son's body of Christ, remember Christ loved us. Father, may we do this in a manner well-pleasing into your eyes. Amen.
Let us pray for the cup. As he took the cup, thank you, Father, for the cup that represents the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. He was crucified for our sin. His blood washes us as white as snow if we repent and ask for forgiveness. Father, may we do this in a manner pleasing to you. Thank you, Father, for sending us, your son, to save us. And we all say amen and thank you. And that finished communion. Now it's the time for us to give back a portion of what God has blessed us with. <clears throat> we are so blessed in the United States of America. Um, there are so many people out there that's in so many needs that we do not even know. Even our brothers and sisters, some of them in church, that we don't know that's in need, but they are. As Holly said just about every week, he said, open your eyes to your heart so that you can see, you know. All the blessings that we give do not have to be here in church, right? People out there that we walk by every day, some of them are in need, but we don't even stop to even think about it. Half of us didn't even think about the blessing that God stored upon us this morning when we got up, and that was to let us breathe and for us to open our eyes one more time to see your family and your friends. But we don't even think about it. It's just a part of nature now. But God said, if you give, he will give you 10 times more than what you can, you can give. So as we think about giving, just open your hearts and your eyes up to when we leave this week, not even while we're here in church. When you go outside of these doors, it's where we're supposed to be working at to bring more and more people to Christ. So when we leave here, I want to pray. Let us pray. Dear my gracious Heavenly Father, all these funds that have been given to you let it uh, uplift your kingdom and let us be able to go and spread your word out in the world, Lord, and bring more and more people to you. Father, we do not know just how blessed we are. So many people tomorrow we will celebrate Memorial Day. So many people have gone before us to lay the past so that we can be free to do the things that we do and to celebrate, be able to come together and just to celebrate you. Father, let us think about the other countries that do not have the freedom that we have. But Father, we just appreciate and love you for that doing what you did for us to, to set us free. And let the funds that we're given be let more people and us to be able to spread your word into the neighborhood and to the country. And may they learn the love that we have learned about you. In your whole son's name we pray. Amen. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth. From the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth. From the depths of the sea, the of the sea let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah.
creations tremble at His voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Who has given counsel to the Lord? Who can question any of His words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? wondrous deeds. Behold our God, seated on His throne, come let us adore Him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore Him. back man i'm really glad that you're here today and again if you just tuned in maybe you're a little late you know this is vacation bible school week man we're talking about a monumental god and so i want to deliver that message to you as well today i'm kind of doing this a little earlier in the week because we're so much going on at church i mean so many volunteers and so many uh just decorations that have to go up and preparations for all this you know we maybe 200 kids show up every night you know we got to be able to serve them and do do this and that and it's just a, it's a joy it's exhausting but it's a joy as well and we're excited to do it and i just pray if there's a vacation bible school where you're close to or wherever you live and that you can get involved in one and maybe bring back some of those childhood memories or build some good ones even for today amen all right all right Here's a couple of verses I want to start with today, and uh, I just think they're wonderful. Great and mighty is our Lord. Do you see that? Great and mighty is our Lord, and I should hear an amen from you today. His wisdom cannot be measured, and isn't that the truth? Man has been trying to figure out God from the very beginning, and trying to simply say that I can outsmart God. You can't measure God's knowledge, and is is just as awesome because He's a monumental. God. Amen. This one I found in the book of Job, and I just love this translation. I want to share it with you today. And it simply says, Behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways, and how small a whisper do we hear of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? The thunder of his power, who can understand? Last night we had a, uh, in Oklahoma, we have some thunderstorms that roll through, and they're pretty, pretty intense sometimes. 
And I was dead to the world. We had been up here working and doing all this stuff. And my wife, I got up this morning, my wife says, man, that was a really bad thunderstorm we had last night. I didn't hear a thing about it. But God can roll in his thunder. And who can understand all of that stuff? So I began this morning by asking you a simple question. When you think of God, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind when you think of God? Something does. I promise you it does. You know, I've heard this said many times, and I've said it to people. I think the more that we discovered, um, I've discovered that many of the problems that we face in our life, and this is true, many of the problems that we face in our life, perhaps even all of them, are the result of a distorted view of God. It is that we don't have a right view of who God is. You go to the eye doctor, and, you know, he sets you in the chair, and maybe you've been there, and they put this big machine on you, and they click these things. This better or this better? Is this better or is this better? And I have a hard time doing that. But when it gets just right, you're like, that's it. You're in focus. You know, and if you have a distorted view of God, you're going to walk with a distorted view of everything, I think, because you never will be in focus. But once you get in a correct view of who God is, and what he is, and how powerful he is, and how monumental he is, then life begins to say, you know what? Yeah, I don't sweat the small stuff as much as I used to. All right, here we go. There was a professor that once said this, and I wrote this down, and he simply said, I know two things about God. That's how he started. I know two things about God. And I thought, wow, that's great, just two? Okay, here we go. He said this, I know two things about God. I know for sure there is a God and I'm not God. <laughs> and that is good. Our view of God has a huge impact in our lives. What's your view of God? How big is your God? How awesome is your God? How, how monumental is your God? Because if you paint your God less than anything that's monumental, less than huge, less than awesome, your God is way too small, my friend. Way too small. Everyone has some kind of vision, if you will, or perspective of who God is. Everyone does. The atheist does, the skeptic does, and even the Christian does. All throughout history, Christians have been trying to figure out this God. We have schools, we have lectureships, we have uh, Bible colleges, and I've got over a hundred books in my library in, in my office. And each one of them somehow try to get you connected to God, somehow to see God a little bit better. And so we're still trying to develop those things in our lives as we should be. There's nothing wrong with that. But how great is the God that you serve? Think about that for a moment. If God is this monumental God, then is he not the one that you should put out front of your life every single day and say, my God is a monumental God. My God, he's mine. I just think that's just fascinating. Now, how does a limited mind understand an unlimited God? How can you and I just grasp it? How can it be just part of us? He's omnipotent and he's omnipresent. It means he's here and he's there at the same time. Everywhere I go, there he is. I never get somewhere where God isn't. Scripture teaches us that. How does a finite temporary being like me that has a beginning and an end understand or try to understand one that has no beginning and that has no end? You see? The more we think we know about God, the more we realize we don't know too much about God. We love God. We try to serve God. But he is beyond our thought process almost at times. We can't put God in a box. Some people try to do that. Have you put God in a box? Some people say, well, God only can do this and he can only do that. Or he can only do it for people like that. But he could never do that for me then you've tried to put God in a box. But let me tell you, my friend, you can't put God in a box. Nope, you can't. That's right. If we could understand everything there is to know about God, we would be God. But I'm not God and neither are you. The Bible says the greatness of God is demonstrated in the wonder of his wonderful creation for us to see. It's all around us. Look at the scripture here. God's purpose for wonder of his creation is given to us to prove that he exists. 
Look at this translation in Romans chapter 1, and I love this one. Watch what it says. From the time the world has, was created, people have seen the earth and sky and all that God has made. You've seen that, haven't you? Sure you have. And they can clearly see the invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. You have no excuse. The world has no excuse for not knowing God. Just go outside tonight. When, when all the lights are off and eh, you know the, the, the moon comes out, just look at God. Teaches you that. Sunset or a sunrise. Just the clouds in the sky can just, just be breathtaking at times. To look at a mountain and all of that, that and, or maybe a river flowing or whatever it is. Just nature itself teaches that there's a God. He's telling us there. Dr. Burrow, the guy from a, um, a Bible college, once said this. Your view, and this is really important, your view of God is the most important view you have. Wow. Your view of God is the most important view that you have. And to the extent your view of God is distorted, to that extent your life is out of focus. And that is true. Because you see, if you don't get God in the right perspective, if you don't realize that your God is a monumental God, that He can do all things, that He can do whatever He chooses to do. For He can, he can cause the blind to see and He can raise the dead. He's that God. He's not a God that you can put in a box. So that's something he did long ago. No, he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Give me an amen. Watch this verse. Oh, I got another one for you. Deuteronomy chapter 33. It says, there is no one like the God of Israel. You see that? There's not one. Nothing like this. He rides across the heavens to help you. Across the skies in majestic splendor. I just love that. Yes. Now, this is important, I think, because we, we, we try to teach, and this week again, we're going to try to teach all these little screaming kids in here and singing songs and all the stuff that goes on. I, I get excited about just thinking about it. I'm looking at these pews tonight that are empty, and I'm actually seeing all these kids in here on Monday night and Tuesday night and so on, and just all their, the joy that they have and the all that they see this. And that's what we want to do is we want to paint that our God is a monumental God. He's not a little God. Let me explain it like this. There's a book. There's a book by Robert Wells, and it's pretty lengthy, but I want to show it to you or share some things with you. It's an entitled, Is the Blue Whale? It's entitled, Is the Blue Whale the Biggest Thing There Is? It is a children's book to try to display or try to show with these, these wonderful pictures of one to show how the child how big the universe really is. Because that's, that's hard for them to grasp how big that is. Do you ever go back to your grade school? I walked into my grade school probably, it's been many years now, but probably 20 years after I left grade school. Uh, I was probably in the seventh grade by then. But anyway, I remember going back to my elementary school and it was like, it's so little. I mean, it's just shrunk, didn't it? But it didn't shrink. You see, everything just looked so big then, right? Well, here he goes on to say, the largest animal on earth is the blue whale. Just the flippers of its tail is bigger than most animals on earth, he says. But the blue whale isn't anywhere near as big as a mountain or Mount Everest. If you could put 100 blue whales inside a huge jar, you could put millions of those jars, those whales in jars, inside the hollowed out Mount Everest. But the Mount Everest isn't anywhere near as big as the earth. If you stack 100 Mount Everest on the top of one another, it would just be a whisker on the face of the earth. But the earth isn't anywhere near as big as the sun. Catch this. You could fit one million earths inside the sun, so they say. Wow! Monumental? Oh, we're getting there, but we're not near there yet. Watch this. But the sun isn't anywhere as big as the red supergiant star called Antares. You could, you could fit 50 million of our suns inside of Antares, they say. But Antares isn't anywhere near as big as the Milky Way. You've seen it, probably. Billions of stars, including superstars like Antares, make up our Milky Way. 
Now, they've sent this little spaceship out into space to take pictures, you know, 20 some years ago, and it's still taking pictures and sending it back. And I, I, envision, I envision God seeing this thing fly through his universe that he created. And I'm, he's kind of like, come on, come on, come on. Because it just keeps going and going and going. And it's not the energizer, buddy. It's a monumental God. Give me an amen. But he's not finished. But the Milky Way galaxy isn't anywhere near as big as the universe. Oh, no. There are billions of other galaxies in the universe that they've discovered in my lifetime. Oh, this is it. Oh, we found another one. Oh, this is it. Oh, we found another one. God is just saying, you haven't even touched the ice, the, the tip of the iceberg, if you will, of the universe. That sounds better, doesn't it? He goes on to say, but most of the galaxies or the universe is totally empty or it appears that way. The distance from one galaxy to another is beyond human calculation in this book, he says. But get this, and this is what I wanted to get to. The one who created it all, all those things from the blue whale that seems to be the biggest thing on planet Earth to the massive part of the universe that we've yet to discover, that one that created that and spoke that into existence sustains it all with his monumental power. Oh, you tell me my God isn't monumental? I'll call you a liar every time. Because my God is not only an awesome God, he is a monumental God. Give me an amen. Oh, I'm going to preach here in a minute. Hang on. Watch. Is he a little God? Do you, all the little BDG gods that people try to make up say, oh, we're just as good or this one's just as fine. Your God didn't do any of that. No, he's made up. He's made believe. This is the God. He is the monumental God. He is the one magnificent monumental God that allows us, and this is what this this is the one that just goosebumps. He allowed this God that created everything that I just described to you allows you and me to call him Father. Isn't that awesome? That he wants me to call him father that's amazing but that still has not done justice to the greatness of God and David in Psalms 139 explains much about God and perhaps some of the 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 best descriptions of God of what he can really knows and the knowledge of and so on and so forth and we'll talk just a little bit about that in a minute but God knows everything about everything and everything about everyone. And he knows all of it at the same time. It's beyond our comprehension, Scripture teaches us. Have you ever been around anybody who acted like they know it all? <laughs> I bet you have. Somebody's bumping somebody this Sunday morning. Somebody would be bumping somebody and simply saying, Yeah, I live with that cat. He thinks he knows it all. Well, with God, it's not acting. It's actually true. He is a know-it-all. He knows it all. How do we know that? Scripture tells us. Look at 1 John chapter 3. The scripture says, But if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Do you know what the word all means? I had a person say that to me once. Do you know what the word all means? And I just simply said, all? <laughs> and it is. It means there's nothing outside of that. It's all. God knows all things. Now, has it ever occurred to you that nothing occurred to God? The first time I heard that statement, I believe it was like at a Tulsa workshop or something that I was at. I wrote it down, and I've heard it many times from many preachers over the years. Think about that. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurs to God? And when I, I was taken by that, and I was like, really? That's true, isn't it? He never has to stop and think about anything. Oh my, I wonder if they're going to get through that uh, uh, the pandemic there. Oh, I wonder if they're going to get through this, uh, um, the, the, you know, this, you, you know, this stuff that's going on down there. No, he doesn't do that. God already knows everything about everything and about everyone. He does. He's kind of like your teenager, someone said. Yeah, they think they know it all. They think they do, but he is the one that does know it all. 
Another one said it this way, that is why secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven. My friend, that's a really true statement. Secret sin, secret sin on earth is open scandal in heaven. If God knows all things and he knows exactly what you're going through and what you're in the middle of. He knows the sin you've been trying to hide from your wife, your family, your friends, your work, from yourself. You've hid back in a closet. God knows. Well, here's the deal. Just admit it. Confess it. Repent. Turn. And God says, I'll forgive you. Monumental God? Oh, yes, he is. Yes, he is. Abraham Lincoln once said this, and I know you know this quote. It says, you can fool some of the people all of the time, and you can fool all the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all of the time. The only thing that I would add to that is you can't fool God any of the time. So quit trying. Truly a monumental God. But understand that God's knowledge is not just intellectual. Isaiah 55 teaches us that. His thoughts and our thoughts are light years apart. I mean, they're, you, just, they're, you can't grasp it. So it's not just intellectual, it's personal. That's what I love about our God. The God that give, did all this stuff and made all these things and created all this stuff and, and spun the earth and lit the stars and all those things, he simply sets across from us, if you will, and he says, I want to have a personal relationship with you. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you have a personal relationship with God? Do you visit with God? Do you sit and drink your coffee in the morning and talk to him just like you'd be talking to your friend sitting across the table from you? You, you can have that. You can actually visit with God. You can actually have a relationship with God, the one, the monumental God. Oh, I pray that you do, my friend. I pray that you do. And that is our hope this week for dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of kids that come through that door back there. Yes. And through all the noise and through all of the screaming, the top of their lungs and all the singing and all the joy and all the happiness and all the, the stuff that will go on in here, what we're, what we're praying for and we want you to pray for is that they come to know Jesus Christ, that they come to know God personally, that they come to understand that God is a monumental God. He's bigger. He's bigger than anything else. And that he wants a relationship with them, just like he wants with you and with me. Can I have an amen? Now you see, God knows you. In fact, he knows you better than you know yourself. You could live 10,000 lifetimes and not know yourself as good as God knows you this instant. God gave his son so that you and I could have a relationship with him. That's how much he loves you. And that is what we are going to try to impress in the hearts of those young souls, those young children to come through those doors this week. The one that made it all wants me. Yeah. The one that made it all wants me, wants you to get, for us to get to know him. He already knows us. He just wants to get us to know him. What he's like. To be able to say, what's it like to make a star, God? Did you ever ask God that? You ever look up at the stars at night and just know, oh, God, you made all this. How'd you make that star? I know you just said, let there be light. It just, what's it like to make a star, God? Well, what's, what's it like, God, to heal a blind man? God, what's it like to watch your son die on the cross for someone like me? Relationship. That's what God wants. Look at Psalms 139. We don't have much time left, but Psalms 139. You have searched me, O Lord, and you know me, David says. You know David's life. I mean, he's chosen by God. He's selected. He has a, he's a man after God's own heart, and he just he's not a very good father. He lusts after another woman. He gets in a lot of trouble, plots a man's murder, and, and has him killed. And it just goes on and on and on, but still yet... Look, look what he does. He comes back to God. And he says, you know all things. You know when I sit, you know when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going and my out, my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. And watch this. Now watch this. This is important for someone. Someone needs to hear this part. Before a word is even on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. God knows your thought before you think it. <laughs> yeah, monumental. Oh, I think so. Yeah. 
Did you hear what he says there? God knows us completely. He does. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're feeling. He knows what you're going through. He knows your fears today. Somebody out there is thinking, you're, still, you're, you're fearful of something. I know you are. It could be the storm. It could be the economy. It could be your bank account. It could be your work. It could be your kids. It could be the pandemic or it could be the struggle of just getting food on the table. But somebody out there is walking in fear today. And you need to hear that God is listening. God understands those things. He knows that you're going through there. And he wants, to, he wants to comfort you. He wants to come in and He wants to strengthen you. He knows your hurt. He knows your anger. He knows your pain. He knows you're dealing with a sick family member. He knows you're, 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 you're hurting because you lost a loved one. And you, he knows that you're, you're dealing with just people of the world or, or even yourself. He knows that. And he wants you to know that you can come to him and call him father, crawl up in his lap, and he'll give you a big hug. And it, it doesn't make everything go away instantly, but it sure does make you feel much better. It'll make your day much, much better, my friend. Crawl up in his lap often. I know when I get there, man, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I, I like it. I like the smell of his cologne. Yeah, it's good. It's good. You're not just another human being on the face of the earth, my friend. You are known and understood by the monumental God of the universe. And for us to try to understand the segment of the universe is really about all we can do. That's why they keep discovering things. Oh, hey, we found this. Hey, hey, we found that. Did you know that was out there? Didn't know that. It's been there from the very beginning when God spoke it into existence. Praise God. And yet God is the one that formed it all. And he has called all the stars by name. I love this verse. Look at this verse, folks. Get this verse. Psalms 147.4. He determines the number of stars. They tell us there's trillions of stars. He knows every one of them. And here it tells us he knows them by name. Yeah. You know what that tells me? This is what I got to believe. There's a star out there named Harley. Yeah. I just got to believe it. If there's a trillion stars and God knows them all by name, he called one Harley. Yeah. And hopefully it's not that one that burn out. <laughs> but what I'm saying is God knows all things. And isn't it wonderful if he knows all the stars and he knows about you, my friend. If he knows them by name, you know he knows you by name. And he knows everything that you're going through. He just wants you to come to know him. Yeah. That's right. Hmm. <laughs> That in and of itself should give you enough wind beneath your wings to fly another week. And with the gas prices as high as they are, <laughs> we need all the help we can get, right? All right, we'll get that far. The Lord searches you and He knows you. All seven billion people on planet Earth, He knows you completely. I just find that fascinating. He knows my good. He knows your good. He knows my good. He knows my not so good and he knows my really really bad and he still loves me he loves me he knows my heart he knows my he knows me like a mother knows a baby yeah yeah someone said you are the apple of his eye isn't that good did you know that did you know that you did anyone ever tell you that you are the object of his affection you are a chosen. You are a holy one. You are dearly loved by him. There is nothing, 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 nothing that can ever separate you from God's great love for you. How do I know that? Well, Scripture tells me. Look at Romans chapter 8. I love what Paul says. Paul goes through many, many things. I just heard a great sermon tonight from another man, and he talked about Paul. I wish I could live up to what Paul lived up to. I could be the fool that Paul was, he said. Here he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution, famine or nakedness or danger or sore? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angel nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth or, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the church says, Amen and Amen. The monumental God that allowed those words, listen to me my friend, the monumental God that allowed those words to be penned in His holy book, the Bible, wants them to be impressed in your heart. Are they? Have you allowed that to happen? 
He wants you to know that when you are His and you know it, you just know that you know that you know that you're His, that there is nothing then that will separate you from His great love. The monumental God, the monumental God has a monumental love just for you. So much so that He gave His Son, that He gave His Son, that you and I could experience the monumental forgiveness in our life that we need. Have you accepted His offer, my friend? If you haven't today, oh, my friend, if you haven't accepted His offer, and if you'll accept today, today, you can have a monumental day today because of the monumental God that gave His Son just for you. So you and I could experience His great love that truly is monumental. God bless you. Father God, I thank you for being our God. We can't try. We, 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 we try our best. We've, even today in this message, we've read the scriptures and we know the stars are out there. and We know the moon's out there and we know the earth spins at this speed and all those things. But we know just this much about you. We want to come to know you a little more, Father. Just a little more. We want to get close. We want to get closer to you, Father. You know everything there is, Father. Help us to hide nothing right now from ourselves because we're hiding nothing from you. Help us to just puke it up. If it's a sin in my life, help that person out there right now just to puke it up and just say, here it is. And you're going to feel a whole lot better because your forgiveness is at the end of that because you're a monumental God that's promised that you would forgive us if we would just repent and confess, turn from those things. And Father, maybe someone out there today, they're feeling bad. They're feeling down and out. Something's been going on in their life. Father, help them to just crawl up in your monumental lap and take a good long rest. Because Father, you will be their comfort. I know you will. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. Bless us. And thank you so much for giving your son so that we can come to you through him. We believe in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, my friend. You be praying for this church, all the churches around that are doing vacation Bible school. Oh, my friend, we need this. Our world needs to know about Jesus. Our children need to be taught about the love of Jesus Christ because they're being, the stuff's being crammed down their throat. It's so sickening. Be praying for all the churches that are trying to teach children about Jesus Christ and God's monumental love. All right? God bless you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move. Mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures Fill my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now I surrender Savior, He can move the mountains my God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory of the risen. King Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory 
of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King.